I think that the most important point here is not to assume, of course, that the phone that you have is the same phone as your students and, uh, and so on, that there are different systems. So there may be apps that are made for one particular system and to run on that system. However, the good news is that lots and lots of apps run across platform. So there are apps that will run on an iOS and an Android system as well. And when you buy uh, or download these apps, you probably go to different uh, stores. So of course, I'll go to Apple's iTunes store on the internet and uh, Barney will go to the Android marketplace in order to download our particular apps. So that's the first disti distinction. Let's move on to the second distinction, which is where are you using these apps? Are you using them in the classroom, for example? Or is your student traveling, perhaps, on a train, sitting at an airport, in a hotel foyer, and they're on the move? And I think that's a really critical distinction to make because mobile learning or m-learning in some ways is still in its infancy in that people are discussing both of these situations um, but there's no general agreement when you say mobile learning whether you're referring to the classroom or whether you're referring to students traveling around um, that's a critical distinction so let's move on, and I mentioned Solar Walk earlier, I mentioned Shazam. These are what we could call authentic apps. They're just made for us, the general population. They have nothing to do with the world of education. Whereas an app that's been created by CUP, Cambridge University Press, will be an ELT app um, or an English language teaching app. Of course, it could be um, an, a, a, an app that might be used in, in, in all language teaching, uh, teaching of other languages, other more modern foreign languages. Um, but otherwise, that's the third useful distinction. And here's another one. Do you pay for apps? Um, well, you could indeed, um, but it might be something really nominal, such as 99 cents. It might be $2.99. It's maybe something that doesn't actually reflect the, if you like, true value of an app in terms of how it was created and so on. So out there on the internet, there is perhaps a very high expectation that a lot will be free. I've just seen somebody's typed in, I stick to free apps. And that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Would you pay for an app? Well, here's the thing. I just took up yoga and I wanted an app. And um, I didn't actually want to download a free app. There were so many of them. Um, and I actually decided I would pay, not a lot of money, but I just psychologically felt it might be just a little bit better. When we come on to dictionary apps, they do have a charge and it may well be worthwhile paying that. Someone just said they had, their ceiling was $5. Okay. And let's have a look now at the final useful distinction. Um, this is whether your app is freestanding or not. So a good example of a freestanding app might be, say, an app from the National Geographic. You download it from the internet. It goes into your smartphone or tablet. And when you open the, the, the smartphone and tap on the icon, then you will be able to use your app. That's different to an app which needs your device to connect to the internet. So let's take an advantage of an app where the internet is essential. That would be, for instance, the Internet Movie Database. That's one of my favorite apps because I love the cinema. I'm always checking who's in which film on the Internet Movie Database app. But if I tap on the screen somewhere where I don't have internet connectivity, all I get is a message which says, your device is not connected, and that's it. Nothing else happens. So that's the other end of the spectrum. Uh, then I need to connect to the net, and then I can use the, uh, the app. Okay, so that's just a brief um, overview of some, some of the different uh, types of apps, because even though we're using this one umbrella term, it's quite clear that there are differences in apps 
differences in um, operating systems, differences in when and where your students will use them, differences between whether it's an app from a language public language teaching publisher or not, uh, different from whether it's free, which I think may be much more attractive to our students if they can download it for free, and whether you do or you don't need an internet connection. So that's the end of the second part of this webinar, and I'm going to move on 